everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, I am here to present to you uh, my paper, Trans Bodies, Cis Minds, the Impacts of Cis Sexism on the Construction and Performativity of the Transgender Self. Um, and I imagine there's probably a fair amount of you who are like, what do those words mean? I'm going to explain them. <laughs> So just before we get started, I'd just like to say a few words. First, I'd like to thank all of my academic colleagues and professors who joined me here today, and thank you to Arteries for organizing this conference. Um, and just a little bit about myself. I know I just got my bio read, but um, I am a third year sociology student. I also am a researcher. I produced a qualitative ethnography um, in the form of a documentary called Mosaic, which was uh, about my journey across North America, where I interviewed 50 different transgender people on their experiences and knowledge around gender, community, and survival. Um, I'm also a, the lead organizer for the RSU Trans Collective, an equity service center and student group at Ryerson. And I've been involved in organizing and, and activism since I was a teenager. Um, and I've done work at the Sherborne Health Center, the 519, and many different conferences, universities, high schools, health centers. I'm also an artist. Um, I produce Starkist Creations, that's the name of my artistic endeavor, um, and I use art as a method of political engagement, personal processing, and community development. And finally, just before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we're gathered here today, uh, which is the treaty territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, and has historically been shared by many different indigenous peoples. Um, we are here today because this land continues to be occupied, and I'd just like to thank the indigenous people who have taken the time to teach me, learn with me, grow with me, and those who gather with us in the room here today. So, trans bodies, cis minds. Uh, my paper discusses the construction and performativity of the transgender self within the context of cis sexism. So essentially, this paper talks about uh, the challenges faced by people who challenge norms around gender identity and gender expression. And I focus mainly on transgender people. It speaks to the unique challenges faced by these individuals and communities as they can attempt to construct and perform their sense of self, which I define as their understanding of their authentic being within their social, political, historical, cultural context. For the paper and presentation, I draw on theorists Goffman, Me, Foucault, Butler, Serrano, Namaste, and Holloway. So, so sexism, generally speaking, is a system of power which uses binary and oppositional narratives around gender to uh, allow for the domination of cisgender, that being non-transgender people, over transgender people. Um, and this process marginalizes trans people. This, the normalization of this power structure is what is known as cis-normativity. So cis-sexism is the power structure, cis-normativity is the normalization of that power structure. These are not that different, but are very distinct from heterosexism and heteronormativity, which some of you might be familiar with. Cis-sexism is asserted in a multiple amount of ways. I focus on the institutional, interpersonal, and internal levels. And as a consequence of these systems of regulation, those who violate cisgender norms, like trans people, are then policed and regulated and this both erases their identities and targets violence towards those who are perceived as de gender deviants. Now, the struggles to construct and perform their selves within this system of power is not a struggle unique to trans people. It's one that we can recognize as an experience shared by all marginalized groups within power systems that seek to erase and dehumanize them. And uh, so sexism is rooted in a history of binarist thought, which I believe uh, has Eurocentric origins and has spread globally through colonialism, imperialism, uh, and globalization. Some theorists, like John Holloway, would also argue that cis sexism is a part of capitalism, citing the Protestant work ethic and capitalist mindset towards gendered labor expectations and the root of this concept of productivity over pleasure, which he associates with how we've constructed and understood sexuality and gender. And even our understanding of being trans or being cis is binary. All that is not cis is trans. All that is not trans is cis. So while Butler has discussed that all bodies use gender markers to construct and express their sense of self, bodies and gender expressions which deviate from norms are more readily recognized as constructed, while others are normalized and naturalized. 
Due to, due to the compulsory assignment of gender and sex at birth, for the trans person to authentically recognize their self, they must engage in a performative rejection of their assigned gender. This can take the form of changing their name, pronouns, the way they dress, uh, their legal sex assignment, or pursuing medical means to change their body. As Serrano has noted, the construction of the trans self is rooted in frameworks which she describes as oppositional sexism. This is the idea that there are two binary, exclusive, and oppositional genders and sexes which are in conflict with each other. In this sense, the trans person's transition is framed as a narrative from point A to point B, when in reality, for many trans people, it's more accurately uh, a sense of getting in touch with their authentic self and sharing that self with the world, which may or may not fit within this binary. So, institutional sexism. While within society with these constricted notions of gender and sex, trans identity then becomes confessional. Uh, this is something that Foucault has discussed before around how power structures weigh on the truth and make it come out through confession. Uh, I discussed in my essay how trans identity is regulated and policed by institutional powers where cisgender experts hold the power to legitimate or disregard the trans person's understanding of their own gender. If the trans person refuses or is unable to confess their gender through the uh, methods that the experts deem acceptable, their transition can be halted entirely. For a more concrete example, think about how the gender identity clinic at Camp H uh, constructs and interprets trans identity. Um, and even if the trans person is given permission to transition their sex, they're still only given two options, despite the complexity and multiplicity of gender and sex. Within institutional cissexism, trans people are only given cissexist notions of gender, thus being given only the tools of their oppressors to construct their selves. And following the thoughts of Foucault and Butler, these systems of power produce what they represent, creating a cycle of identity manufacturing. Now, while the institutional level of cissexism is very important, there's also a level of interpersonal cissexism, which uh, is the regulating and policing of trans identity between people. Trans identity can be regulated and controlled through moments and relationships that perpetuate cisnormativity and police gender expression. These are present through the processes of socialization, and these indoctrinate people into cissexism as a system. This is a process that we all experience, whether trans or cis, we're indoctrinated into this system. Some examples would be the use of transphobic humor, uh, sex assignment at birth, um, the assumption of people's gender, fear or violence in reaction to discovering someone's trans identity, sometimes known as the trans panic defense. Um, these micro and overt aggressions which assert sexism perpetuate the domination of a single type of gender, that being cisgender. Now, the key aspect to my paper is the internalization of these structures. For the trans person, um, the construction of the self is hindered. Um, see, Goffman would describe the construction of the self as a process between belief and cynicism. I think we probably all can understand that. Um, you believe in the self that you are, and then maybe you have doubts about the self that you are, and this is a process of natural growth. Um, but for the trans person, this system is interrupted because of the intense policing of their sense of self. Um, this cynicism is given no place, and if they show any hint of cynicism or doubt, especially in regards to their gender identity, it can be used against them and to delegitimize de them and their identity. While it's true that, as Serrano has noted, Many trans people have a profound sense of understanding in regards to their gender, which inspires them to challenge these cisgender norms. I believe that they are still uh, given the right to have their own questions, doubts, complicated feelings about their gender identity, and should be given the opportunity to reflect on these things critically. When given only cissexist notions of gender and sex, and identity and expression, the trans person learns to conform to norms or be punished by them. And this struggle can result in a lifetime of trans people wanting to become cisgender because that is what they've learned is normal, rather than engaging in self-acceptance. So, with all that in our minds, the next step, I think, is to discuss liberation from these systems. Um, this is a very 
difficult concept because there's not really a single method of liberating oneself from successism. I mean, institutional norms and power structures are really well integrated into society and deeply, deeply internalized by all of us. Some people argue that the beginning of dismantling sexism should come through legislative means, like the creation of transgender human rights. Some of you might be familiar with uh, local efforts to try to get transgender human rights included into the Ontario Human Rights Bill and the Canadian Human Rights Bill. Other theorists, like Namaste, would argue that while this method may be important, if it's not used in tandem with other methods of dismantling the projects of capitalism and colonialism as a whole, if we can recognize that sexism is rooted in those systems, pursuing just the legislative means can actually de be detrimental to the larger process. Personally, I found the empowerment of trans people on the interpersonal level through honoring the knowledge, stories, and experiences they've gained from their uh, journeys as being trans persons is a really good place to start. So in conclusion, I just I'd like to ask you how I'd like to ask you to reflect on how you can dismantle sexism and cisnormativity uh, through tactics like education, advocacy, the destabilization of cisgender norms when you recognize them, and the support of trans people inside of your communities. Whatever your method, I encourage you to recognize this as an ongoing process for the benefit of trans communities and for yourself. Be cis, trans, something else. Uh, no matter who you are, learning to recognize and challenge and create alternatives to oppression is, I feel, part of a larger process of acceptance, liberation, and freedom for all of us to be authentically ourselves. Thank you for your time. Now we have a few minutes for questions, and if you'd like to read a copy of my essay, please approach me after this presentation. I'd be happy to give you uh, my business card, and you can go visit my website. I have an abstract available for free, and I uh, sell a gift for pay what you can. Thank you.